We should probably bring in Candace Kelly right now um, and let her know that she's stepping into a powder keg this morning. But I would think if anybody could understand, um, it's Candace Kelly, especially after the emotions we saw, Candace. Good morning to you. Felonis Floyd on the stand. I love this family. We can't help but to wrap our arms around this family. So dignified, so great. And at the same time, Candace had to be so careful on the stand not to open the door. Um, why don't you explain and take us through it from yesterday's testimony? Yeah, absolutely. Good morning to the both of you. You are correct in that um, when George Floyd's brother, Felonis, was on the stand, he had to be careful not to open the door to get into testimony on cross that might open the door so that we really assess and get into the life of George Floyd and who he was as a person. There's this whole idea that you don't want your witness to say what a great, big, soft, nice teddy bear he was and, and that he was so nice in every single thing that he did because then that opens the door for cross-examination for someone to say, well, was he nice? And then bring up that information. But as you said, this was a wonderful way to bring the prosecution's case to a close, as will probably happen today, so that those who are moving on and in, in hearing in the jury what the defense is going to bring, which they're going to bring information that's going to go against the grain of what Falonis said, this was a great way for the prosecution to say, this is a man, this is a man who had a family, understand that he was a human being that people loved. So let's look at him in that way, as opposed to the way that you're about to see the defense probably bring him up. I mean, the smile on his face, the stories that he brought, mm. the pictures that we saw were just, were wonderful to shed light on this man who had a life that was snuffed. Yeah, we, we've heard all this testimony about how he died and the possible cause of death. Why, why was the timing so important? Why was it so important for him to be one of the final uh, people to take the stand for the prosecution? You know, <laughs> Uh, Felonies is the one who has been out in the open speaking on his um, on his uh, on behalf of his brother. And so what we see is somebody who is well liked, someone who has been out in the community defending his, his, his brother, someone who's able to make sense of his life, of the person alive, and also someone who we believe and trust. This is someone who has already made a name for himself to be the spokesperson for the Floyd family. So the jurors, we know that they've seen him. This isn't something that, uh, you know, they, they, they could be, uh, you know, th that could be hidden from. Um, so because of mm -hmm. that, because of the reputation that he has, this was a way for the prosecution to really end it well, along with the other use of the force mm -hmm. expert. I think it was an amazing way to close out their case, which they're almost done. Yeah, so we're going to see what happens um, on the stand today and then as the case transfers, if you will, into the defense's hands and, and how they, what we expect, how they'll execute the case. Um, I want to talk about that neighboring case, though, nearby Candace, where yet another unarmed, they did not find a weapon, uh, black young man is gone after a ticky-tack traffic stop. The calls for the officer to be fired... Uh, the mayor says he's already there. What might she face in addition to losing her job if, if it happens? Because you heard the police chief in that case push back a little bit about due process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, what we're going to hear is, is starting already, and that is let's try this case in the mm -hmm. public first. It was, you know, it was a, a mistake. So in that case, perhaps it was negligence. They're already building the case before our eyes. And this is why we're hearing details about what she thought was one thing as opposed to the other. When we know, first of all, that tasers and guns are, tasers and guns are normally held on opposite sides of the body. We know yeah. that this woman has been a police officer for 26 years, yet she didn't know the difference. Um, we, we know so much about this case already that is not leaning up to something that looks good for her. So she could face obviously losing her job, which I think will be forthcoming, and she's going to face charges, if not at the very least, a, a charge of being negligent, a charge of manslaughter attached to this particular crime, because this is what this was. This was a crime for someone that when you, you listen, I've gotten stopped, mm -hmm. um, you know, for something similar, but I was mm -hmm. able to live. But that doesn't mean that when I see police officers behind me, 
I don't quickly get out of his line yeah. of sight because I know mm -hmm. what is could potentially be involved for people who look like you and me. Mm -hmm. This has to be handled on a federal level when we talk about immunity. Yes. When we talk about this whole idea that almost 20% of the people who were a part of the insurrection on January 6th were people who were out there to serve and protect us, are supposed to be out there to, mm -hmm. to protect and serve us. So when we look at all of these things, we know that change has to be made. And people are fed up. And this is what we are seeing mm -hmm. right now. It was one too many decades ago. But this is where mm -hmm. we are right now. So we're going to see her lose her job at the very least. And I think that that should be happening very soon. Yeah, we haven't seen much change at all since the 50s and 60s. Seems like we're still fighting the same fight. Uh, and the jury in the uh, Derek Chauvin trial, they're, they're seeing everything that's happening here. I mean, there haven't been sequestered, and there was a call to have the jury sequestered uh, on yesterday. Uh, Judge Cahill denied that. Uh, what did you think of his decision? Do you think that was the right call? Yeah, you know, this is one of these things that now, if I'm the defense attorney, I am thinking that we've got to sequester these jurors, no doubt about it. But with the same token, how much can we protect somebody from the world and things that are going out there yeah. in real life? Yeah. Even if they leave, even if they're sequestered, they're not going to be sitting in their hotel 24 hours, right? They're going to look out the window. They're going to see things happening where they are. How can they get around this? We already know that the $27 mm -hmm. million dollar, uh, settlement is something that many of them heard of. I think it's fair at this point and that the prosecution is about to rest and they're going to be sequestered next week that they are asked every day. Anything that you've heard out there in the world that will make you think one way or the other or present some type of a bias, for now, that is the way to go in terms of the timing, in terms of the interruption of this case, and just in terms of the fact that this is America. This is the world that we live in. And unless you are living under mm -hmm. your bed, you are not going to see mm -hmm. anything other than what, what you are seeing. We've gone through the voir dire process, and that process said that you were going to be an impartial juror. <clears throat> I think the work has been done for now.